Hey, y'all. So last week, we went on down to Vicksburg, Mississippi, and explored the haunted history of the McRaven House. And what we found was that the legend surrounding the original owner of the house was intertwined with a man that was well known for not exactly being all that great of a guy. It was a man named John Merle. Basically, John was what they called a land pirate out on the Natchez Trace. Cool name, right? Now, during the late 1700s and early 1800s, farmers and loggers from up north would float their goods down the Mississippi River to sell in Natchez in New Orleans. And since steamboats weren't invented yet to get them back up the river against the current, they'd have to walk home. So they'd use the Natchez Trace and travel from Natchez, Mississippi up to Nashville, Tennessee, like it was a highway. But on this journey through the wilderness, these men had all that cash with them from just selling their stuff, making them the perfect targets for guys like Merle. And as we'll discuss today, Merle had quite the reputation that spanned beyond being a land pirate on the Natchez Trace. I mean, the legend just starts with the fact that John Merle's father was a preacher and his mama taught him how to steal. And because of that, some people say that one of his ploys was to go into a church on Sunday, keep the congregation hypnotized with some good old Sunday morning preaching. But meanwhile, his gang was outside the church robbing them all blind. Now, if that ain't a good start to a tall tale, I don't know what is. John Andrews Merle was born in Virginia in 1806 and raised in Tennessee. He was one of eight children. It's said that Merle's father was a Methodist minister and his mother operated a brothel when her husband was out riding his circuit. The Merle boys clearly took to their mother's side more than their father's as they were all known to have engaged in criminal activity of some form, whether that was stealing horses, grand larceny theft, or counterfeiting. In fact, John's youngest brother, Jeffrey, was even said to have operated a brothel of his own before he turned 20. Unsurprisingly, John Merle got himself into a bit of trouble over the years as well. As a teenager, he was sentenced to six years in prison after being tried and found guilty of being a horse thief. But this punishment hardly put a stop to John's way of life, and there's a good chance it might have even bolstered that determination to live outside the law. After his release in 1829, Merle and his gang of associates began operating along the Mississippi River and the Natchez Trace. The men were quite simply highwaymen, stealing from travelers on the trace. But in addition to acting as thieves, they also stole enslaved people to resell to other men. And Merle was so shameless that if he discovered the stolen man had been labeled as a runaway with a reward offered for his capture, he approached the owner with information and claimed the prize himself in spite of his own involvement. Eventually, though, this is the crime that got John Merle arrested once again in 1834 and then convicted and sentenced to serve 10 years of hard labor at the Tennessee State Penitentiary in Nashville. A man by the name of Virgil Stewart who may have actually run with the outlaw, provided the most damning testimony in the case. Stewart claimed that he had been hired to retrieve a stolen slave from Merle, but when he caught up with the infamous highwayman, he decided to ingratiate himself into the gang as a strategy to accomplish his goal. Yet Stewart was not successful, and the enslaved man was never found. Perhaps unsurprisingly, Merle's testimony painted him as a heroic character, who captured Stewart, claiming that he was the dastardly highwayman. But the ruse was pretty transparent, as anyone who knew Merle was aware of his propensity for mistruth. Now as for Virgil Stewart, it's unclear exactly how he became involved, and possibly even why. He is responsible for the capture of John Merle, and it was on his evidence that Merle was convicted. But many believe his story was completely fabricated 
in order to make himself the hero, and that he was in fact actually a thief in the Merle gang who merely turned on the man after some sort of falling out, or possibly even just in an attempt to profit off his capture. Then, in 1835, about six months after Merle was put away, a small book was published titled A History of the Detection, Conviction, Life and Designs of John A. Merle, the Great Western Land Pirate. The story, which became something of a bestseller, was a sensational account of John Merle's life as a highwayman, describing numerous crimes he committed and placing him as the head of a vast criminal conspiracy involving hundreds of people from Maryland to Louisiana. This criminal organization was said to be known as the Mystic Clan or the Clan of Mystic Confederacy. According to the book, John Merle was quite a talkative fellow who loved to brag about what he had done and he told the author, a man by the name of August Q. Walton, that he had a greater plan in store for his mystic clan. He intended to grow it so large that on Christmas Day in 1835, they would incite a slave uprising all across the South, allowing members of the group to seize political power in cities up and down the Mississippi River, places like New Orleans and Natchez. Obviously, this revelation struck a nerve with many in the South, who lived in constant fear of an event of this nature. And as a result, a wave of paranoia took over southern states, particularly Mississippi. Now, every outsider who came into a town was deemed a potential criminal in league with the Mystic Clan. This is what led to the Merle excitement in Vicksburg. There, a group of gamblers from out of town, men who were already seen as having unsavory reputations, were convicted during a sham trial and executed as co-conspirators to a plan that didn't actually exist. After all, it's widely believed that this book, supposedly authored by August Q. Walton, with later editions listing H.R. Howard as the author, was actually written by none other than Virgil Stewart. As for his preposterous claim of a planned slave rebellion, well, it turned out that it was nothing more than a marketing ploy to sell as many books as he could. Fortunately, not everyone took the story as seriously as they did along the Mississippi River. Many in Merle's home state of Tennessee were skeptical. People who knew him said it just didn't make sense, acknowledging that this was nothing more than Stewart continuing to capitalize off tarnishing John Merle's name. Yet Stewart seemingly made a fortune anyway. However, by the time John Merle died of tuberculosis in 1844, the entire account was regarded as false. But that didn't stop the larger-than-life legacy of the great Western land pirate, whose infamy had grown to such epic proportions that Mark Twain himself wrote of him in his 1883 memoir, Life on the Mississippi, comparing John Merle to Jesse James. Quote, Merle was his equal in boldness, in pluck, in rapacity, in cruelty, brutality, heartlessness, treachery, and in general and comprehensive vileness and shamelessness, and very much his superior in some larger aspects. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently produced podcast created by siblings Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider with the support of listeners like you. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to receive even more content, including ad-free episodes, head over to our Patreon page today. The link is in the show notes. Lucky Lady Shacks.